It's beautiful. Praise be to God. All right, so I want to talk about this story. This story always gives me goosebumps at the power of God in this story. But I like for us to look at a piece that I think kind of gets overlooked a little bit because it's in the midst of all the action. You know, we, once Jesus arrived and he's been with the sisters, there's a point to where Jesus does something that I think we're all called to do. And that is talk with the Father. You see, the Father is, is the one who's helping Jesus do this power. We know the Trinity, right? We know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is doing something for our benefit and for their benefit. He is talking to the Father. He is giving the Father the credit and the glory for what is about to happen. You see, in verse 41 through 40, through about 42, he says, so they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up and said, See, he didn't instantly just to call Lazarus out. He looked up and said, Father, thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you, I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. See, Jesus is letting people know who he came from. His power is not his own. His power is from God. He is the Messiah. And he is letting people know this. And it's crucial, I think, that he took and he stopped in that moment and gave credit to the Father. In that moment, he was trying to, to lead them to the Father and allowing them to see the Father's magnitude in what he was doing. See, I tend to lose that part of the story before I, I wanted to highlight it before we got deep into the story because I think that's extremely important. You see, Jesus has been healing and throughout this sermon series, as we head to the cross, I've told you we're going to encounter people that Jesus encountered. We have encountered the blind man last week, and this week we are going to some of Jesus' beloved friends. Jesus is away, and he hears of the news of Lazarus. And he doesn't rush back. Now, if one of my closest friends were sick, I'd probably rush home to be with him. But Jesus says, no, I'm not rushing back. This sickness will not end in death. Even if he does, it's not going to end in death. Jesus already knows. He says, no, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus already knew that he didn't have to rush himself back home. He knew that they needed to let Lazarus lay in that tomb for four days. He knew the glory and the magnitude of what was going to happen when he went back because he was in connection with the Father. He knows the plan that God is laying out. He knows the power of what's going to happen because if he'd rushed back right then, it wouldn't have been as powerful. So he waits another couple of days, and he knows, and so does his disciples, that if he rushes back there, he's got people who don't like him there. He's got people who really would like to stone him and put him to death. He knows this. His disciples know it. And we know this from the aspect of when the disciples said, you know, Thomas, we know Thomas, right? Calm down, Thomas, at times. Says to the rest of the disciples when they when Jesus tells them that Lazarus is sleeping and Lazarus and they're like, well, he'll wake up. What's the problem? He says he's dead, y'all. He's dead. But he's not going to remain that way. And then Thomas says something that I, I think we can kind of miss at times too. He says to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. I think he thought that Lazarus had come to, to his demise because of his belief in God, because he knows that it's dangerous there for believers. And we know that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are believers and followers of Christ. They are close to him. So Thomas in that moment must have thought that they've gotten Thomas, or they've gotten Lazarus. And he's like, okay, if you say so, we'll go back and die with him. And Jesus had to, in that moment, he doesn't say it, had to go, Thomas, sweet Thomas. 
But they go back, they go back, and when they arrive, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. Four days. It is not like when we go to a funeral four days after someone passed who's been embalmed, at this point, they have just put herbs on his body. The sisters know the condition because those who you love, you go and you put herbs and you put spices and, and things on their bodies at burial. And when they arrive back, Martha sees Jesus. And Martha tells him, she truly has strong belief in him because she says, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. I know it in my heart. I know that you would have kept him from dying. I know your power. I know who you are. And I know if you'd have just been here. See, Martha doesn't recall what we know, which is in Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13. We see the centurion. Do you remember the story of the centurion who, who comes to Jesus and says, I've got someone sick in my household. And Jesus goes to go with him. And he says, no, I don't even, my house doesn't even deserve you to be under the roof. Just say it. Just say it and I know it will happen. He knew that all that Jesus had to do was speak it and it would happen. His belief was that strong. Martha, in other, other words, I don't want to say her belief wasn't as strong, but she was so in her grief, her logical mind could not wrap around what God was going to do in Jesus. She could not wrap her mind around the fact that her brother would be raised out of a tomb in four days, after four days of death. And she says, if you'd have just been here. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again, Martha. And Martha says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection, in the last days. See, Martha knows. She knows the hope of the resurrection. She knows those things. She's not processing what Jesus is wanting to tell her, but I think he meant that to happen. Because in this moment, after she speaks this truth about the resurrection of the last days, Jesus introduces her, himself to her in a new way. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live and even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks her a question, church, that I think he poses to us every single day of our life. He asks Martha, do you believe this? Do we believe this, church? Do we? Amen. This is something we have to ask ourselves on a regular basis. Do we truly believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life? And in him we have life. It is crucially important for us to remember that and ask ourselves and remind ourselves on a daily. Because here's the thing. None of this happens without belief. Every person that Jesus encountered had to take a step in believing. The man last week had to believe enough to go to the pool and wash. We have to believe. The centurion believed enough that Jesus could just speak it and it be so. Because Romans 10 reminds us they confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart and you will be saved. Yes. Belief is a part of all of these encounters. Jesus just didn't go up to people and say, you, get up, you, you're not blind, you, come on. He didn't do that. He took belief from someone who was witnessing Belief and faith is how miracles happen. Belief and faith are how God is glorified through us. And church, I'll be honest, that is some of the hardest things we can do as Christians at times because we have a human brain that is very logical thinking. And at times we process through and we say this is not even logically possible. I have to think that the disciples and Mary and Martha have to think this is not even possible. That the moment that Jesus says to them to roll away that stone, and he speaks the words, Lazarus, come out. The 
there had to be a moment that some people in the crowds had to go, this is not logically possible. What is this man doing? Belief and faith in the power of God is not always logical. We know that. If we look at our lives, I guarantee you there are parts of your life where you have had faith and you have believed, where God has done things in your life that does not make rational sense. Amen. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that faith or belief will be logical. You find that verse, you tell me where that, that comes into play. It doesn't. We have to believe what we can't see. We have to have faith that God can do the things we ask of Him. But I need to tell you, church, I'm not preaching prosperity gospel, so let me tell you that for sure. There will be times that we will ask God for things that God will tell us no. We will believe it so hard in our core that it will happen. But I will tell you, just like Jesus, Jesus did not do this for Lazarus' benefit to get up and walk and be with his sisters because he liked them. He did it to glorify God. There are going to be times that we ask for things that only bring us joy or we want them. It may not be to lead us closer and deeper into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our purpose, these blessings, our faith are so that people witnessing it can know the Lord, can come to know, and that we can grow deeper in our belief and our trust in Him too. It is easy to say, I trust God, I believe in God, I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when He gives us what we want. It's when we have faith through the no's. When we have faith through the times that are hard and trying. That's when our faith is sharpened. But God does not. God does not leave us or forsake us. But he gives us what we need. You may have prayed in your life for things that you wanted. I will tell you as your pastor, I've prayed many a times for things that I wanted in my life that would bring me such joy. But it was not something that was going to be required of my life for me to know God more. We are on a journey to know God more. And everything that Jesus is doing on this day in this story is to help us know him more. Help the people who are seeing know him more. Because just in their customs, when someone passes away, just like we do, y'all, somebody dies, we go to them. We, our community surrounds around them, and if they're weeping, we weep. We, we take them too many casseroles. It's just who we are. And these, these Jewish people have went to be with Mary. And when Mary gets word that Jesus is there, she takes off like a bolt of lightning. And I could just imagine her holding her dress up, taking off, running. And they're thinking she's going back to the tomb to weep. And so they go with her because if our sister's falling apart, we want to be there. We want to hold them up. These Jews get there and they get an opportunity to see this miracle. They get an opportunity to see the love of Christ that they have for Christ and that Christ has for them. They get an opportunity to see something that's very rare in Scripture. They got to see Jesus weep. They got to see him put soul, be there for his friends. But they also started to question, right? Because many have heard of him. They've seen his signs of blind men and lame men and and we know how the hemorrhaging woman just touched his cloak, just a little tassel to be healed because of her faith. We know they've witnessed these things happening, but then they're a bit logical and sarcastic. It doesn't say in Scripture they're sarcastic, but your pastor's interpreting it that way. Because they say if he's the man, if he's the man who can make blind see, why did he do something about this? And I can just imagine Jesus going, just wait and see. And then he does. He does for Mary and for Martha something amazing. He says to them, did I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I'm asking you, church, Jesus is asking us, 
Do we not remember that if we believe, we will see the glory of God? Amen. We can hang on to that. But Jesus asked them right then and there. After Martha has said he's been in there for four days, his body is decaying and it smells, Lord. But he says to move that stone away and he says, did I not tell you that if you believe, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took the stone and then he talks to the Father, y'all. Don't forget he talks to the Father. And we're called to talk to the Father because the power that Jesus harnesses is because he is fully human, fully God, <coughs> sent from the Father divinely. And he does, He already has had this conversation with the Father, but he's letting them know. And I'm going to tell you, for those of you who have a hard time praying out loud, people need to witness you talking to the Father. They need to witness you talking to the Lord because there is power in prayer and talking to God. And Jesus is modeling that here. He is giving God the glory and he is doing it for our benefit and theirs. And then he does the amazing thing. He says, come out. He says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus walks out in his burial garb wrapped around his face. And it doesn't say, what Lazarus' thoughts were. I always wondered why they didn't share a portion of what Lazarus had to say when he walked out of that tomb. Can't imagine. All those people standing around. You've just been raised from the dead. Can't imagine what that must have felt like to be Lazarus. But I can tell you that as a human, I can tell you what it was like when when I put Jesus as my Lord and Savior in my life, and I, everybody else got a chance to witness it, all I saw was smiles. When we witness someone coming to life in Christ, it gives us hope, and it brings us joy. And we can celebrate. I imagine they celebrated like nobody's business, y'all, that he was raised. But I guarantee you that their belief was solid. Would you have doubted in that moment? After that, I imagine that's one of the reasons the disciples went to death without denouncing Christ because they have seen, they have witnessed, and they know. I imagine, church, if they were asked by Jesus, do you believe this? Do you believe that I'm the resurrection and the life? There was no doubt in their hearts in that moment. Church, I pray that we are a church that knows our God has this kind of power. That we are a church that knows that in our belief and our faith and our trust in God, even in the knows, that God will show us. God will show us God's glory. We will see it if we believe. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I ask that in those places in our life where we wrestle with belief, when we wrestle with no's, when we wrestle with trusting you, with seeing you, with, with our heart of faith in our eyes from our spirit and not our logical brains, God. Because, God, you don't make sense. The things that you do for us doesn't make sense. Your grace doesn't make sense. Your forgiveness doesn't make sense. You coming to die on the cross doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to be logical, God, but it is true. And God, I pray that we are a church that knows the truth. That we are a church that leans into that and has faith in you and that knows that no matter what, as long as we confess you with our mouths that you are Lord, God, and we believe it in our hearts, we know that you are Lord, and God, that we believe. Help our unbelief, God. In the areas of our life where we are struggling to believe, help our unbelief. God, we love you. We thank you. And on this way to the cross, God, we are examining <coughs> ourselves. And Father, we ask you to come into those spaces where we wrestle with our belief and our trust in you. Because, Lord, we know we're called to trust you, to obey your word, and to know that you speak truth in our hearts and our lives. God, we thank you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.